Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. I think you've already been Hello. able to work out that I'm not Jon Snow, uh, who is in Greenland with Ban Ki-moon. Right. And uh, my name is uh, Maureen Freely. I'm a, a novelist, translator, colleague of Andrews at, uh, at University of Warwick, <laughs> and uh, also, uh, rather shockingly, the, um, the new president of English Pen. And uh, I'm uh, here today to um, welcome you to a celebration of art and literature with a political purpose. Very, very radical idea on this island, but we'll, we're going to change that. And also uh, to mark the launch of Lacuna, an online journal that's the brainchild of one of our panelists. More about that later. And Lacuna aims to fill the gap between uh, the day-to-day -day journalism on uh, human rights and injustice <coughs> and uh, s the scholarship <coughs> on the same subjects, which nece of necessity comes much later, is for an expert audience and has to follow uh, the rules of whatever discipline it's in. And so that's quite a big space. And we also aim to um, open up spaces for, for um, young and, and new writers. And um, they've already begun. If you go to uh, lacuna.co.uk.org.uk or .co? .org.uk. Oh, okay. Yes, excuse me. Um, you'll see that uh, they're already doing this. And in fact, the idea um, grew out of um, a series of uh, workshops um, that Andrew Williams and I did uh, a number of years ago that turned into a module um, about uh, you know, writing about human rights and injustice. And our students did such amazing work. And we realized there was no place for this work uh, in the scheme of things. And so why not open up these spaces? And so we're very, very lucky. Um, I notice some people in the audience are looking away modestly now. We're very lucky to have some of them working on this project. Uh, I'm, um, been, I'm a longtime member of the Frontline, uh, so it gives me particular pleasure to welcome our guests uh, to the Frontline because um, the Frontline is what um, you know, gave me the idea and taught me that you can open up spaces that can run alongside organized media and, uh, and other groups. And actually, uh, instead of what we used to do, um, I have a, a previous life as a journalist. And when I was a journalist, I spent most of my time with other journalists complaining about our bosses. And, um, and when the front line uh, opened, then we could talk about the serious things in the way that we wanted. And uh, so that idea very much fed into uh, uh, writing wrongs and lacuna. Now, I'm going to uh, introduce, first of all, I'm um, going to introduce uh, my colleague, Andrew Williams, who's over there trying to look like he's not there. Okay. <laughs> um, he is Lacuna's uh, editor-in-chief, and he teaches law and creative writing at Warwick. Um, and he's the author of A Very British Killing, The Death of Baha Musa, which won, uh, as many of you will probably know, it won the Orwell Prize for Political Writing last year. Although uh, no one has yet been brought to justice for Baha Musa's murder. Uh, and next to Andrew, we have Layala Sumpfin, who's a, a poet and works on the campaign uh, team for Plans UK, which is a child's rights uh, NGO. And she studied human rights at the University of London and writes uh, poetry on um, quite a few dark subjects, death penalty, indigenous rights and conflicts. Uh, and you also worked uh, for, the, for, a char for an NGO for Bosnian children. Mm -hmm. um, I might get you to talk about that a little bit later. Um, and uh, as a member of the collective, the Keats House Poets uh, co-edited um, a wonderful book of poetry called uh, In Protest, uh, 150 po Poems for Human Rights. And it's a really lovely book. Um, I recommended it, and I hope it's somewhere there. Yes, it is. <laughs> and uh, at, uh, sitting next to her is Christine Bacon, who, uh, who is uh, from Australia and worked as an uh, actor in Australia uh, for a long time until um, the, uh, Australia's treatment of asylum seekers and refugees uh, was uh, so appalling that we decided to do something about it. And she's done um, uh, many um, taken part in many grassroots campaigns uh, on, uh, in this area, including Actors for Refugees in Australia. And then in 2004, lucky for us, she came to do uh, uh, an MSc in forced migration at Oxford and 
founded um, uh, Ice and Fire's Outreach Network, Actors for Human Rights, um, and will be uh, uh, have the privilege of seeing uh, 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 an excerpt from one of her plays uh, later on. And uh, you may wonder why I was um, I skipped you, <laughs> but there's a reason because uh, I don't think uh, that. Uh, Beyond saying that Leslie McIntyre is a c completely amazing photographer who um, worked as a freelance for, for, for many years in London, I'm not going to tell you more because we're now going to watch a film that says it so much better. So the photography, going back to the photography, I mean, I've always thought photography was partly about bearing witness. And with any kind of moment in time, the photograph can be proof that something happened. I mean, I was working as a freelance photographer in London, and um, through a sort of network of women that were London-based, I um, was approached by one of them who was actually working at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in the education department. Um, and she said, you know, do you feel like going to Greenham Common? And we, we, we formed a group, most of uh, the women were two writers, I think an architect, me, photographer, and Kay, my friend, who was an art education. Mm -hmm. And we went down in the car, and I didn't really know anything much at all about Greenham, to be honest, at this stage in the proceedings. I'd barely registered anything about it. And we drove down the M4 on a hellish sort of afternoon, absolutely, you know, sheet rain. And um, I just remember getting to this sort of perimeter fence, and there's something about all military establishments, even, you know, there's a sort of bleakness about them, really. Uh, and being sort of aware of this relentless bit of sort of fencing. And then we came up to the main gate, which is where the initial camp was sort of established. Um, and I was just confronted by a sort of an aesthetic, apart from anything else, a sort of an image that I just found absolutely extraordinary, which was, you know, women sitting on sort of things like sofas and armchairs underneath of, a, you know, five umbrellas, and they're just all talking. And there was a level of kind of passion and debate that I, I mean, I just found it absolutely fascinating. And I just thought, I remember very early on, I just thought, whatever this is about, I'm going to come back. I got to know the area very well. I mean, I used to walk around the perimeter, so I kind of knew lots of the, um, the whole kind of geography of the exterior of that particular camp. And there was one uh, gate called Green Gate, which was the one nearest to the silos. And just along from there one day, and I was, it was again a rather lovely day, warm day, hardly anybody around, but I kind of sensed something was going on. I could hear women talking. And they went through the trees, and I suddenly I was confronted by uh, somebody I knew called Rebecca, and this woman who was wearing like a summer sleeveless dress with her long blonde sort of ponytail and running through her hair. She'd got ribbons in the suffragette colours. And she was holding the fence. And on the other side, there were American servicemen and women who at the time were reinforcing the top of the fence with looked like coil razor wire, with a barbed wire stuff. She was holding one of the coils tight to the fence. She managed to get a strand tight to the fence. And suddenly the order was given to pull it away from her. And in the process of pulling it away, the barbs became embedded in her hand. So she was in agony suddenly. But they were all just watching. It was really strange, absolutely silent, sort of impassive faces. They witnessed something, but there was no kind of, no dialogue at all with any of them. In October 1984, I gave birth to my daughter Molly, and from the, you know, immediately it was identified that there was something quite profoundly wrong at the birth. So really, within a couple of days, um, you know, my whole life changed totally. And any future plans I had made, um, you know, just 
completely um, <laughs> just disappeared and went off the map because I was suddenly being faced with the reality of having this tiny baby girl who initially people didn't think was viable at all. And we were told she would die within a couple of weeks or months. There was no expectation initially that we would ever get our baby home from hospital. So, of course, Greenham then just went way into, you know, that was just something I could no longer be engaged with. Prior to Molly, um, I knew very little, probably, about um, issues to do with disability, physical disability. And you really just go day by day. When you have a child that you think might die, and you have no guarantee of, at all as to how long she will live, um, you really are just managing the day to day. So at the beginning, you're just holding your breath a bit and, you know, just getting this little character to the point where she's a little toddler and, you know, it gets to the point where she needs to go to school. And that, of course, was a watershed because I didn't know how to get her into mainstream education and it was an enormous struggle to get her into the local primary school. Uh, it took years, but in time I did get her in. But it meant a lot of, you know, in a way that's what I learned at Greenham Common. I learned how to campaign, and a lot of the skills I acquired at Greenham became incredibly useful in progressing and protecting my child's right to be part of society. I was concerned that it was it, it you know it was too intrusive, but she also understood why we had to do it. And part of my because I used to talk to Molly about it, and I said it's not just about you, Molly. The legal case that we're progressing, if we can win it, actually will affect many other children who have similar disabilities. And I sat her down, and I actually sort of said, darling, you know, this is up to you. If you feel you can cope with being interviewed and talking to some people who may well want to sort of ask you questions about how you feel about not being able to get, you know, get to the same areas of the school as many of your friends and or, you know, issues like this, um, that would be helpful. I think it will probably make the case more real for many people if they can see you and see what you're like. But I remember saying, you know, if you don't feel like doing it, that's no problem either. And she kind of mulled it over for a while, and she just said, I'll do it, Mum. That's fine. She, she was a gutsy, wee character, really. I felt she had a courage. and an, she, Every opportunity I tried to create for her, when she had the energy, she'd just go for it. And that was extraordinary to watch. Not everybody does that. If I'd failed to acknowledge my child's very uncertain life expectancy, it would have reflected a denial of the blindingly obvious. I remember having a very strong sense throughout our time together that if I was to keep something of myself intact in all of this, not to be consumed by the ever-present anxiety of what the next day might bring, I could only hold on to my individual self by continuing to work as a photographer. Somehow I managed to achieve this in spite of the symbiotic nature of our relationship, typical of a single parent of a child with Molly's degree of disability. 
I was able to pick up my camera, and by doing so it enabled me to think of something else. That is how to make a particular image. In those moments of concentration I had a reprieve, as everything else that might have been concerning me at the time went into abeyance. In a sense my world shrank after her birth. So many things that I had assumed would be possible were suddenly completely out of the question, and instead I found myself captivated by the details in the day-to-day. And of course the irony is that her constantly tenuous grasp on existence gave our life together an extraordinary intensity. And through the photographs I tried to capture the essence of this physically barely viable yet determined character, one that I knew could not be with me for long. I didn't cry this time. I've watched it several times. <laughs> One of the many wonderful things uh, about um, um, your film is uh, that you're describing uh, discovering things along the way. So you went to Greenham Common and you weren't expecting it, and then you connected with it. There was an aesthetic. I, I want to come back and ask you mm. about the aesthetic. So, uh, but also um, then um, your life changed and you took something very, very important with you. Before um, you spoke uh, on this film, had you uh, thought very carefully about those connections or was that something that occurred to you later? I hadn't thought very carefully about it, no. But whenever I've got involved in anything, I mean, most of the work that I've made, which I've said, which I would feel probably happiest with, for want of a better way of putting it, was always when I was just working, in a way, on my own initiative. Mm -hmm. So not commissioned work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was never paid to do anything at Greenham. I felt a commitment to record it, mm -hmm. because what I felt I witnessed or saw there was something truly astonishing, a moment in history that was sort of unprecedented in a way, and an extraordinary ability to sustain a non-violent you know, demonstration and, in, in that manner. I mean, I'm sure I would have remained involved for longer if I'd been able mm -hmm. to. But I always tried, in and around it, to, to make, you know, I was, I do care about composition and things like that. I was always trying to get an aesthetic image as well, I suppose, or a symbolic image, maybe, a metaphor for it. But what uh, struck me um, this time uh, when I was watching it is that um, the aesthetic comes first. In other words, it's the aesthetic that makes you understand that something extraordinary is going on. So it, it, it implies that the two things are not, you know, art is not separate from the... Well, I spent the, years yeah. in art school. I mean, it's all <laughs> rubbed off, you know. <laughs> 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 you know, I couldn't have composed to the four corners. I mean, it's rigorous, you know. Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to do that. When, when I'm really concentrating and functioning, you have the primary subject, and then it's how you place it, how where you are in relation uh -huh. to, it, uh -huh. to, to it all the time. Yeah. Crucial. Yeah. Yes, that's how I'm thinking. But there's also the um, you know, the problem that uh, those of us who work in journalism in one way or another, or have done, uh, that uh, you know one keeps one's sanity by doing those special things um, for no money or very little money. And then there's the day job, or that not the day job, but the um, mm. there are the people you have to. Um, who want particular things? You're what looking was at my me. day job? No, I know what you're, you were. <laughs> no, it's just sometimes you, you sometimes you um, were a photographer. Yes, I mean I did lots of different work, but yeah. you know it's it's when I was engaged more emotionally, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. That that's just yeah. when I probably felt I was functioning at my best. I yeah. Guess. And uh, what? Uh, what exactly um, would you say you, you took with you um, when you were looking after Molly? What was the most important thing? Oh, Lord, that was a different thing altogether, really. I think I felt I just wanted to try to keep my skill functioning. Uh -huh. And uh, because so many commissions I uh, was beginning to set up just were impossible. I mean, I was planning to go back to Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was something that was being discussed. <laughs> anyway, 
um, I just wanted to not lose the skill I had. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, well, I have to work within what is possible now in this domestic bubble to a degree. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there was a great American photographer called Imogen Cunningham. And I loved one of her quotes, which I probably won't remember absolutely accurately, but she said, you're no damn good if you can't take a photograph in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, OK, you don't have to travel like Cartier-Bresson, you know, you don't have to necessarily go all over the world to be able to make an image that resonates. Mm. Mm. And, you know, I was, obviously, because of all the baggage with a child with her wheelchair and all the rest of it, I was on one camera, one lens. And I was, I suppose, just thinking, well, what can I do with this constraint? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't plan to make a book. I was just photographing to just, because I love taking photographs. But it was a way also of me kind of keeping the skill I had going. But also, you were talking about a, um, a very, very intense, close relationship, which um, this, uh, in a certain sense, in, you know, it was uh, added to. Yes, yes. yes. yes it was so it's going back and forth. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep thinking, Lila, of the, um, uh, the introduction by Ruth Paddle in, in your book, mm. uh, and she quotes Emily Dickinson. Mm. And if I quote her now, I'm going to quote her, I'm going to misquote her. Can you, do you remember? Um, I have it right here. Oh, I mean, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, she quotes Emily Dickinson. Um, another thing that Ruth Paddle says, which I think yeah. can be applied across the arts, yeah. is she says poetry is language under pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And that language is made through the pressure of the world around it, and that creates the need for you to write. Yeah. And perhaps the need for you to take photos, the need for you to uh, write a play. Um, but it's the pressure of but form. But it's the pressure of, of the constraints of that yeah. form, yeah. plus yeah. the constraints of the world that, yeah. that you're working in as well. If you wouldn't mind reading the very beginning yes, that I'll uh, misquote if I... <laughs> so, um, this is the hour of lead. No, it's the other, oh, earlier on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Which one is it, sorry? <laughs> the right At the very, one. very beginning. Yeah. Very, oh, here we are, sorry, apologies. <laughs> After great pain, a formal feeling comes, wrote Emily Dickinson. And then? Uh, one miracle of, of, of being human is the way our need for meaning is met by our equally powerful need for pattern. Yeah, but that's what I was thinking of when you were, uh, when you were talking about composition. I mean, I'm sure that's, there's, there's, that com there's a combination there. You're sort of standing back. But at the same time, I was very conscious of trying to make images that also sort of resonated in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I only work in black and white. So it's slightly abstracting, but I think it also makes the, the subject clearer in a funny kind of way. Mm -hmm. and, but, but I also yeah. didn't, you know, I, when I say this, I wasn't really, you know, I, I just try to keep making photographs. I don't know, some days they were quite sort of, you know, weren't as carefully worked on as others. I had no idea what I was going to do with them. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the making of a book in time wasn't in my mind at all. No, no, it wouldn't be. Uh, but then the book, uh, the book is here. So um, mm. what happened? How did you come well, to pull it together? It, it was after Molly died, because there are about three quarters of the contents of the book I never saw in printed form, or even as a contact sheet, and until, until after her death. Because I was much too bound up in the day-to-day -day management of our lives, her life, you know, and, and <laughs> fighting legal actions and God knows what. I didn't have that time. So it was only some years after her death I went into the dark room at the university where I've taught off and on for years and had was free range for a while in an empty dark room. It was bliss. And slowly I started printing up the negatives. And it almost, you know, I suddenly was aware that actually what I'd recorded was a life effectively from birth until death. And there was a kind of, in time, with working through them all, I found there was a kind of logic. The, re the edit almost revealed itself. You know, they're in chronological order. They show all aspects of this particular life, like any other life to a degree, a beginning, a middle bit, and an end. So there's a kind of, I wanted it to, if possible, 
because I had a child with a physical disability, I wanted it to demystify disability a little so you engage with a human being and you get the gaze. So it, I think it needed to be a photographic form in a way to, to, to tell this story. <coughs> it would have been very hard to write to describe her physical presence, I believe, and the changes in it. The photographs reveal that. And given attitudes to disability and the complete obsession in the society with body image in general, I really wanted to address that particular aspect and how beautiful she was. She was to me. And I was trying to convey that to other human beings. And it's a record that inclusive education can work is evidence of that. And I feel passionately about that. I think it's a civilized way to be, to not exclude and hide human beings off. So that was possible for her. That's what I fought for. And it's what she fought for as well. She was, yes, she certainly yeah. she went with it. You know, I was so nervous at the beginning. I thought, what have I done? I've gone against everybody's advice, you know. I thought it was going to be a catastrophe, but she was fine. But you also gave her a, a way out, and I think she probably, it sounds like she understood that, if, that she... She always had the yeah. option to not yeah. do things. Yeah. yeah. If she didn't want to do them. Yeah. But she tolerated quite a lot of interviews, both on television and radio. She was very articulate. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to um, move on to Lila, and um, you're going to read some of your poems. Yes? Mm -hmm. okay. Um, these are three poems from the protest section of In Protest, 150 Poems for <coughs> Human Rights. Um, the first one is called The Demonstration by a uh, Scottish poet, Douglas Dunn. I don't know if any of you have ever been on a protest. Anyone? <laughs> yeah, I thought there'd be someone. So this might sound slightly familiar. <laughs> The demonstration. It looked as if about to become very nasty. Helmeted, holding shields and truncheons in riot gear, the whole extremely uncomfortable wardrobe. The police squared up to the students who waved their banners and bottles of mineral water. Some were outrageously got up as fairies, not a few in kilts. Others, like undertakers, top hats, tailcoats, carrying the coffin of their cause. Young women flaunted legs and behinds, many of them singing the beau gondam. Bugger this, said the officer in charge. We'll beat them at their own game. He passed the word to his second in command, who passed it on to the third, who passed it on, along the incredulous, obedient ranks. Then the policemen lay down, and the students carried them away. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a, the dif a different result from a sit-in. Um, <laughs> and it's a, an amazing example of how you can take the struggle and the difficulty of going on protest when you've got so many hopes and ambitions, and it's fantastic that he's able to use comedy to 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 dramatise a situation like that. This next poem is by Kit Fan, who's from Hong Kong, and it's about his time at school when Tiananmen Square happened and how this was explained to him as a school child. Among school teachers. The gate closed, bell unanswered, Basketball court stripped bare to lines and sparrows. July is never the month for learning. A school on clear water bay road, yet no water, bay, nor road. A bridge along the scar of a hill through the lotus-flowered magnolias I used to cross over to the clamour of books. A month of no children, but the translucent playground after rain recalls the aftermath of hide and seek. What's the time, Mr. Wolf? 
the tick-tocking knees, the run for life, a boy under a tree, restless for the world to spin in ten seconds. That summer, among school teachers, we stood and sang. Not the psalms and gospels, but farewell and falling men. How bodies became mountains, how the wind knew of sadness, the soil of love. The colour of blood was the colour of our flag. In the assembly hall, children who knew little of death had seen images of guns and wounds, a speck of a person stopping a column of tanks. It was a clear day, but we were all shut in, the ground deserted to the democracy of the sun. The sisters buzzing their way to the dead of summer, the world waiting under some tree, a thousand souls still singing in a dark assembly hall on Clearwater Bay Road. And this final poem is written by Kate Firth, who's both a speech therapist and a poet from Bristol. Um, it's called The Laughing Father, uh, the, not The Laughing, The Laughing Fathers, that's a different poem, uh, The Laughing Farmers, and it's about an incredible protest where the main key ingredient is laughter. And this is about 50,000 farmers in Karnataka in India who stood up to a corrupt official. The Laughing Farmers. Because they had no power, they had no words that anyone would hear, so they laughed. This was their protest, their power and their weapon. Some would call it madness, to march for miles, to simply sit on the lawn of the chief minister and laugh. <laughs> Was this a laughter of hysteria or vision of a genius who knew that when your rights are stolen, laughter is a choice between survival or defeat. They could not be moved, laughing for hours in the sun, to laugh the government out, for laughter is the greatest triumph and the greatest humiliation. Drowning in the unrelenting echo of, of hearts that couldn't be bought, the chief minister became ridiculous. And for 50,000 laughing farmers come election time, the name of the chief minister remained a joke. <laughs> Very good. Could I draw you out a little bit on, um, on the laughter and the joke? I, Generally, um, if one says one is writing about um, these subjects, that's how people look. It's supposed to be very, very serious. But you're making a, um, uh, or your poets are making an important point, aren't they? Yes, definitely. I think laughter is an incredibly powerful tool. I think comedy is a very powerful tool to confront human rights abuses, to stand up to terrible situations and spin them on their head and spin the power structures on their head as well. And there are a lot of very harrowing poems in here, but there are also a lot of poems which stand up and say, no, we're going to show you how ridiculous you are um, by using humour. How did you come uh, in, into this um, uh, difficult wisdom in your own life? How did you learn? Um... Um, I mean, I'm a poet. I really struggle to write funny poems. I think it's a <laughs> lot easier to make people sad. I think it takes incredible... Um, wisdom to make people laugh and to have that confidence. Um, so if ever I see a poem which is funny, is able to use that drama and theatricality, I'm instantly drawn to it. Um, but also you have a very, very um, active cam campaigning life, yes? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this is going on, you're, you're, you're writing your poetry and um, working with poetry <coughs> and so on, and also doing, um, you know, working with people who are suffering terribly. Uh, th is this something that you also saw in your work uh, as an activist? Yes, um, definitely. I think empowering people to be able to speak about their situations and their lives 
is something that, that's very important. I work at Plan UK mm -hmm. with young campaigners, um, both from the UK and from Pakistan and Malawi, and they speak about child rights. It's young people speaking about child rights. And I think that's something that's very important in the arts, like giving people the power to speak about their own lives. There are lots of poems in here where people have researched human rights issues and written incredibly powerful poems. But I think there's a real need to support people to tell their own stories as well. And can you give an example of some children's stories that have something that we could never, um, we um, grim adults could never? Um, um, <laughs> I can ask you later. I mean, I, we were doing a workshop in Malawi and we were asking um, the children to define what they understood by the word advocacy. And I'm sure you could do a PhD on that topic. Um, but they said very simply, and this is why children should write the dictionary, um, they said, it's <coughs> carrying my friend's voice because she can't speak. So sometimes children have this incredible ability to cut through all of the jargon and nonsense and get straight to the point. And they need to be given the strength and support to be able to, to raise their voices, I think. And you've also um, done a lot of work um, with poetry workshops and um, working with people who are involved in human rights. What's going on there? Um, I think poetry can be an incredible tool for condensing incredibly complex situations that are filled with layers. Recently I did a workshop at Keats House on International Women's Day where we actually took um, human rights law, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and we broke it apart and we turned it into poems. So both critiquing it and using it to create a found poem. Mm -hmm. And I think pulling apart legal language is something that's very important to try and understand the, the heart of an issue. And I think a poem can get to the emotional heart of an issue. There's also in your space. collection, there's something of uh, BBC, it was a Today programme, is it? There's, the, 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 that's if you want to explain that one, that was really... The poem about the, poem the BBC about, running order. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we have a chapter in here called Expression, which looks at the different ways that people express human rights issues. And someone did the, a quintessential version of the found poem. He listened to the the news, um, a poet called Mance York from Manchester, he listened to the news in last August at 8am and he literally wrote down the ordering of topics and at first on the list I think was cheating in badminton, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> the amount of gold medals won by XYZ person and the incredible unfairness and at the very end of this list of eight news items was the war in Syria. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was really in a very in a poem of about perhaps twenty lines or something. We had a direct narrative of the news we hear, and I saw and, it very clearly. And then a line at the end, mm. um, which um, is what turns it into a poem, really. Exactly. Yes, like, yeah. yeah. That was really really good. Um, well, we're going to move on. We're you know, we're like a fast moving express train. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, Andrew, I'm going to, uh, I know how much you're looking forward to this. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and so, uh, are you going to read a little bit from uh, A Brave British Killing? Yes, I thought yes. I, thought I would. It's, uh, it's only a couple of pages long, but uh, it needs a bit of introduction. I guess this book is, is in the theme of what we've already heard, it is a protest. It's my form of protest. Um, and very often you retreat to methods of protests that make you feel comfortable, that um, break down some of the barriers that otherwise can seem insurmountable. And it was, for me it was writing, but also protest against um, my own background as a lawyer of some 20 odd years and uh, academic for the past 10, 15 years. And they bring with them very great constraints of form and language uh, which I hate. Um, but, <laughs> and this was my rebellion as well as protest. But more importantly, it was, it was a response to image as well. It was the image of a, uh, a man um, uh, uh, on an autopsy slab who had been photographed um, prior to the autopsy 
and the man's name was Bahamusa, and uh, he had been beaten to death by a British unit in Basra, in a British um, base, middle of a base, and um, I came across it through my legal work. And seeing those photographs, which were revealed in um, a, a piece of litig litigation that was going on to try and find out what had happened for the father of Bahamusa, um, it provoked in me a, a great anger. And again, writing was a way of trying to channel that anger. And I also thought that anger at the detail of this, and it's the detail really that this this piece I, I wanted to sort of draw out. Brief introduction, this is um, uh, on the second day of Bahamusa's capture and internment at this British Army base. Um, he, um, he had been captured with nine other Iraqi civilians. They were um, uh, hotel workers uh, caught up in a sweep by British uh, this British Army troop, taken back to base for uh, interrogation. And um, bizarrely, a GMTV crew had turned up at the base on this morning, the second morning of their incarceration, to interview the commanding officer of the base. And uh, they didn't, they parked about 20 yards away from where all these Iraqi civilians were being held. And the camera crew went to see the commanding officer, and uh, two of the drivers uh, went to go and have a look at what, what they had heard was going on down the, uh, just where they parked their Land Rover. So, um, I have to wear glasses these days, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, and the, the young aircraftman who was one of the drivers was called, uh, was a man called Scott Hughes, and Spence was a warrant officer who was one of the investigators. Anyway, Hughes told Spence all he had seen and heard. He repeated Riley's account of how the media ops crew had found itself in Battle Group Maine, which was the British Army base, with the GMTV team. He said he was first drawn to the shouting at the detention block soon after arriving in the Land Rovers. Lance Corporal Riley heard it and wondered what was going on, he said. Hughes was intrigued and used the excuse of unloading his weapon to pass the block on the way to the designated unloading bay. As he did so, he saw a soldier, whom he described as Male One, next to the portaloos outside the detention block, waiting with a set of plastic handcuffs, tapping them against his hand, saying to someone inside the temporary toilet, Come on, you can piss for a rack inside. Why can't you do it now? Yes, sir, yes, sir, an Iraqi voice came from the toilet. Hughes looked in both doorways to the detention facility and saw various prisoners cuffed to the front, sandbags over their heads and sitting cross-legged on the floor. He passed two other British male soldiers slouched on the ground outside one of the doors and greeted one of them. He said, what's going on here then? The second soldier, babyface, about 18, told him they'd just caught the prisoners in a hotel with a load of weapons and they were suspected of killing the three MPs in August, which was untrue. But a fourth soldier emerged from the detention block. Hughes went on with his chat. How can you do this? He asked, not accusatorily, but with disgust at the smell of sweat and piss coming from the building. The second soldier shrugged. The fourth said, if they caught you, they'd cut your balls off and make you eat them. Hughes wandered back to the Land Rovers, hearing Male One shouting all the while, Get your fucking arms up. Keep that fucking head up. I'm going to fucking kill you. He put his rifle in one of the vehicles and then returned to the detention block like a moth to flame. With his usual friendly demeanour, Hughes continued to chat with the guards. He asked them how long the prisoners had been in the detention block. 36 hours, he was told. They'd be, they're being interrogated one by one. We've been ordered not to let them sleep. Why does it stink so much in there? Hughes asked. They've pissed and shat themselves, wouldn't you, with bags on your head and all that shouting? Male One came out. He asked Hughes what, was what he was doing there, and Hughes told him about the GMTV crew. Then Male One went back into the block and resumed his shouting. Get your fucking head up! He didn't seem bothered that journalists were sitting having tea in the CO's office a hundred metres away. 
Hughes peered through the doorway. He saw Mao Wan behind one of the detainees, placing his hand over the hooded man's face and yanking his head back. The scene drew Hughes into the building. No one objected to his entering. The guards were wholly at ease with his presence. He said hello in Arabic to one of the inmates who responded in kind. To another he asked, again in Arabic, how are you? These were stock phrases learnt by army personnel. The detainee placed his hands on his heart and then his forehead in salutation. Hughes wandered along the corridor between the two main rooms of the block and looked into the middle section that was an old toilet. There was a man there sitting on a flattened cardboard box. Hughes carried on, ambling from room to room, back and forth. Get your fucking arms up, Grandad, mail one again. For an hour, maybe an hour and a half, Hughes said, he meandered about the building, inside, outside, watching through the windows, the doorways. He saw many things, he said. Mail one, pressing his hand over a sandbagged face, seemingly trying to stick his fingers in the man's eye sockets. The soldiers kicking at the feet of those inmates who didn't keep their legs crossed beneath them. The fourth soldier instructing one of the detainees to say, fuck you, whenever he clicked his fingers. The same guard squirting water hard into the mouth of a prisoner who had pleaded that he was so thirsty, so hard that he couldn't swallow it properly. Male one shouting, no sleep, no sleep, over and over again. A major appearing at the portaloos, smiling, noticing nothing. Male one using karate chops on the neck of the prisoner they called Grandad because he couldn't keep his head up. Punching, <coughs> kicking feet, a kick to the kidneys, a fifth soldier entering one of the rooms and slapping one of the detainees about the head and leaving again. Get your head up or I'll slit your throat from male one. A detainee lifting his sandbag for a moment. Male one catching him. You thought I didn't see that, didn't you? A kick to the groin. The detainee doubling over in pain. The choir singing out with grunts or groans when male one went behind them and kicked them in the lower part of their backs, the guards laughing. Another soldier coming in, a big man, six feet tall, muscular, broad, bald-headed, wearing a purple t-shirt and combat trousers, entering casually, having a few words with the other soldiers, and then walking up to one of the detainees, slapping him once about the head, throwing a kick at the man's kidneys so that he keeled over onto the floor, pulling the man up again and then leaving. It was shocking, not just for its violence, but the sheer speed and flippancy with which the soldier appeared, struck, and was gone. It was all so natural, so commonplace. So I guess that, that was ind indicated to me uh, so many things of the detail of the abuse, but also primarily that nobody cared. It was just natural. Everybody knew it was going on in the base. Everybody could hear it. The portaloos outside were the portaloos for the whole unit which was the, the battalion, the 1st Battalion of Queen's Lancashire Regiment. And it was that detail that was lost in all the press reports that a man had died in custody. Um, and I, uh, what I thought was the necessity of actually trying to use the aesthetic of writing to communicate the detail of what was going on to get to the, the bigger picture, ironically, rather than the more detail. So you, you're using the word aesthetic now again. What do you... What do you mean by that? I've been asking you that for a long time now. <laughs> I think it's that idea of breaking down the barriers of communication in a way that people can access, understand, comprehend in a way that isn't interfered with by um, uh, uh, jargon, technical terms, or just university, ranting in or a way. Or university rules. Or, yes, the university rules of, uh, of proper writing. Um, and evidence. And evidence, yes. Yeah. I mean, the, the book is based on, on a, a vigorous approach towards uh, evidence. I mean, vigorous in the sense of um, trying to look at more detail than you would possibly see in any court case. The detail that lies behind just the facts, the detail of of the little things that wouldn't be mentioned, um, the pettiness of behaviour, which wasn't overly abusive, but was just almost childish in its nature. And getting to the root of what that meant about us as a, 
as a people sending troops out in our name and not really caring what they did when they were out there. And the aesthetic element of that is to try and break through the press reporting of it or the legal um, uh, description in court, all very dry, all very mundane, all very accurate. Um, and I suppose the aesthetic here was trying to get to a deeper truth. But you were using um, you know, a very, very high standard of evidence. Where was the evidence? The evidence was triangulated from statements from all those people involved, from the forensic evidence mm -hmm. that was corrupted in the part, but it was, there, were, there was some, um, and the, the statements and transcripts that had been undertaken over years. So it was a, it was a major cataloguing process to get to the kernel of what was going on. And then uh, there was the question of what was going to happen to uh, the high standards of evidence when you wrote for a general public? The problem, I suppose, of uh, a lawyer's evidence is that it ends up being forensic to the point of dehumanizing the people it talks about. Mm. And um, it has to, of necessity, in a way. It has to sort of um, have its own legal aesthetics uh, to retreat from anything that people would normally associate with trying to describe violence or trauma. Um, it suppresses that because it, it has to give a balanced view. And this is very balanced, but it's written in a way that at least will make people connect rather than um, just see evidence for evidence sake, it will see the humanness that lies beneath the evidence. But it's also the, the first person who connects is the person who's writing it. Okay. Yes. And um, when I was listening to you read, uh, read t t today, um, there was no disguising your anger. <laughs> it wasn't. I mean, that's, uh, it's very contained. It's uh, anger yeah. under pressure, if you want to talk about, talk about form again in the way that we were. But it's very, very strong emotion. Do you not? If, if I was honest, I'm, I'm extraordinarily angry. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't uh, display that, but there's an intense, deep-seated anger at who I am within this country, who we are, who we, uh, who we pretend to be, and in the sense that we don't look, we don't look for what we do. We don't look at how it's done in our name. We don't even accept that it's in our name. Um, and the anger of being faced by the images, you know, some of these around the walls, I noticed, uh, this is us. We do this stuff. <laughs> it's all very well sort of having war correspondents take photographs in other countries of other fighters and abusers, but that's what we do. And that realisation of seeing the, the hard evidence of it was something that, that made me intensely angry. Yes, but in the book you're doing something about it, uh, yes? Um, well, I, I mean, suppose that, that, that's, the, that's where the anger is internal as well, because there is a sense that I'm not doing enough. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's, it's about protest. It's about that sense that you have to find some way of protesting at the very, at the very least. And sometimes that's as risible in a way of, of, of writing a book. But on the other hand, maybe that's the best I can do. One of the things I appreciate most about the book is that it's very, very detailed about this uh, uh, grotesque uh, travesty. Um, and, um, and it lets the facts speak for themselves. But it also makes very clear that the patterns, uh, you know, the, the cover-up that's, you know, the, the investigation that's really a cover-up and mm. so on, is a pattern that goes back um, a very, very long way. And you make yeah. that clear as well. Did you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's such a long history. <laughs> um, how much history do you want to go back to? If you just do post-1945, um, uh, the British have been involved in 17 wars, 
in foreign countries, as they were described, um, since 1945, and in every single one of those conflicts, there have been instances such as described in this book, uh, significantly more in many cases. Um, and the techniques that have been developed in terms of interrogation, suppression, oppression, uh, getting information, the excuse of getting information, or just terrorizing the local population to succeed in whatever campaign they're involved in. Those techniques have been learnt, have been communicated, and have been trained. And that's what this shows. This isn't a bunch of uh, soldiers run amok who just had no control. This was trained. This was how they were, how they were uh, brought to behave. There's a place called Chicksands in Berkshire where they were trained. The, uh, the methods that were used were um, developed in Malaya, were developed way back in the end of the Second World War at the London Cage in Whitehall by a guy called Lieutenant Colonel Scotland. Um, they were practiced in Kenya. They were practiced in Aden. And most in emphatically were practiced in Northern Ireland. Shoot to kill? What a surprise. Uh, it was more than just shoot to kill. It was a systemic approach towards using these methods of violence, of interrogation, that were communicated from generation to generation within the service, and it's been proven. The techniques that were involved here, trained at Chicksands, were the techniques that were outlawed in Northern Ireland by the British government itself, Prime Minister Heath stood up in Parliament and said these techniques would never be used again by the British Army. That just about sums it up, I think. But I would say that uh, what you're doing then is, um, uh, it, we, it goes back to the same thing that we keep um, returning to, which is making something visible. And it's uh, making the, uh, the, the, the structures um, of, uh, you know, of cultural violence and institutional violence that um, uh, that ex exclude people and uh, and make injustice invisible. So yes, mm -hmm. so it's, it's that same sort of thing. Yeah. So I was going to uh, come to you, Christine, uh, because you you come become involved in this uh, for some of the same reasons. Yes. Yeah, very personal reasons. I was I was an actor, just living my life, having a lovely time in Australia, and never had done anything political in my life really. And, um, and it was the, uh, the actions of the Australian government towards asylum seekers arriving by boat in 2001. It was a very controversial incident. Uh, there was a, a, a boatload of about 400 asylum seekers from Afghanistan and Iraq. They were coming to Australia by boat. Their boat started to sink. They were rescued by a Norwegian shipping vessel. And according to the laws of the sea, they were meant to bring them to the nearest port of call, which was Australia. And uh, the Prime Minister just left them he personally intervened and left them on these open seas for about eight days while he figured out what to do with them. And he, New Zealand took 100, gave them refugee status within a couple of weeks and they got on with their lives. And the rest was shipped off to this tiny island nation called Nauru, which basically survives on Australian aid. Um, and they were, they were kept there for the next four years. Um, the Prime Minister subsequently won the election, which was, he was going to lose. Um, and, you know, if these, these events are shocking enough in, in themselves, but the most shocking thing to me was that 85% of the Australian public agreed with the actions of the government, and he therefore won the election um, that, I, that I said that he was going to lose. So I was, I was, that was my kind of moment <laughs> of, of just saying, hang on, what, why do I think differently <laughs> to everyone else? I'm looking at these pictures every day on the news going, hang on, hang on, hang on. Um, I always thought Australians were different to this, um, and I, I decided to get involved. I went to a local meeting that, that a charity had arranged, and I met a woman who had survived the sinking of another ship um, where 353 people drowned around her, and she survived by holding on to a, a corpse for three days in, in the sea and was rescued by Indonesian shipping uh, fishermen, not, not any government. Um, and, I, and she was there at that meeting and she told her story for the first time, I think, um, a very unrehearsed 
sort of uh, explanation of how it had happened. And, and, then, and that, that, that was another lightning bolt moment because I, for me, it was so vivid what she was, you know, this, this encounter with this woman. And, and I thought, if only other people can have this experience, <laughs> if only other people can hear what she's saying in such an authentic and, and immediate way, surely things would change, surely people would think differently. And that was really where it, where it began. And, um, yeah, and, and then uh, since then I, yeah, I started a, a campaign called Actors for, for Refugees in Australia. Then I came here and started Actors for Human Rights and it's a network of over 650 professional actors who are dedicated to drawing public attention to a range of, of human rights concerns through first-hand accounts. But at Ice and Fire, we, we're a theatre company that explores human rights stories through performance. So we are, we are an arts company and we do full-scale productions as well as, as this, this arm of our work, the Actors for Human Rights arm, which is very, <coughs> very bare bones. You know, you sit on a chair, you read, you read a script to an audience. Um, but what we're, what we're going to be presenting tonight is, um, is an excerpt of a, of a play, a full um, production that we're putting on next year. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, should I talk about what it's about? Is that where I should go? Yes. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, just to reiterate, wanting, wanting to make something visible. I mean, the reason I wanted to write this play, um, it's about the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War. And this happened in 2009, the, the end game in 2009. And you'd be forgiven sitting here in the audience for not knowing that even happened because it really is still a dark hole in history. Um, but tens of thousands, you know, the UN says 40,000, but many others have estimated it could be way more, up to 100,000 people were killed, <coughs> civilians were killed in the space of about five months at the end of this conflict. Um, and I am supposed to know these things, right, because I run a theatre company that, that deals with human rights issues, but I did not know this happened. And a friend of mine... Um, said, I, I want you to read this stuff I've been writing. And she'd been going around the world interviewing survivors of this, this, this series of events. She gave me her manuscript. And it was shocking in terms of its subject matter. But yeah, again, the shocking thing, why? Why don't I know this? Why haven't I heard this? Why is this not common knowledge? Why isn't this n not some big international controversy? Why is Sri Lanka not being held to account for all of this? Why is the president who, who ordered all of this to happen still the president and being re-elected as the president of Sri Lanka? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really, was really that as the impetus is how, how do we find a way to, to make this vivid, as vivid as, 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 as these stories were um, for people who, who really have no idea it even happened. Um, and to, yeah, fill in that black hole in history. So. And so now we're going to um, change the scene. Great. And, uh, and we will not forget to take these little things off. Yes. And, and then we'll reconvene. We'll come up again after, after this performance. Right, so I'm just going to invite yeah. th um, three actors to the stage. And if you... <laughs> down. I should take this off as well. Um, so let me just introduce Annika Rose, Michelle Bonnard and Paul Trussell. Um, we're just going to read a short extract from the script. I'll be reading the stage directions. It's, it's quite difficult to, to do an extract from a, a play, particularly when it's a production that relies upon, you know, lights, uh, you know, uh, weeks of rehearsal, that kind of thing and sound effects and, you know, there's a, it's a cast of nine, so we've had to double up a few roles here. But you just have to sort of use your imagination and sort of go with us on this. Um, one of the, the slight um, weirdnesses uh, through, through this is that Paul is, playing, is going to be playing part of a doctor at one point, that that doctor is supposed to be a Sri Lankan doctor, but obviously just use your imaginations. <laughs> um, background. So, Civil war in Sri Lanka went on for 25 years. It was an incredibly brutal war. The Tamil Tigers were the guerrilla movement within the country. They, they controlled areas in the north and east of the, of the country, a small island of about 20 
million people. Um, and towards the end of 2007, the government decided they were going to go in for the kill. Um, every other government in, in the world had told them, you will never defeat the Tigers militarily. They're too strong, they're too, they're too good at what they do. Um, but they built up their, their army, they got a lot of arms from other countries, a lot of loans from other countries, and they just went in. The UN had to withdraw into, from, from the north, from the tiger-held areas in 2008, and all of the other NGOs withdrew. No journalists were allowed in. No one, basically, was allowed in, apart from, apart from the army. Um, this uh, extract is, um, let me just, it follows when the UN um, has withdrawn. Rebecca, who's played by Michelle, is a UN employee who's been working up in the north for four years. She's allowed, she's, she's allowed to go back in with a, with a convoy of supplies for 24 hours to see what's going on, give supplies to the civilians, and then get out again um, while this war is raging around. Um, what else do I need to tell you? Uh, but, uh, Rebecca and Mila have been, have been friends for about three years. They've, they've made, made a friendship over the time Rebecca's been working there. And that's all I think I need to tell you. Yeah? <laughs> I hope it's clear. <laughs> As I said, it's, it's strange to sort of go in and out of a play. Um, right. Neela is packing up her things in order to move again. A large number of people are on the move. Through a loudspeaker we hear an LTTE cadre. You must not panic. We have control of the front line and everyone is secure. Do not attempt to cross over into government lines. Please listen for our instructions. There is nothing to fear. We will tell you what is best to do. Rebecca enters wearing a flat jacket and helmet. Put oh, your skin and bones. How are you managing? No injuries? Where's everyone going? We're just walking to the next place. Away from the fighting. Well, people are carrying everything they own. Oh, Rebecca starts taking photos. Have you seen bodies? I tried counting like you asked, but I stopped now. What number did you stop at? Something like 300. And you hear stories. Everybody is hoping that there will be help for us soon. What kind of help? But on the radio, some are saying India will definitely do something. Or maybe now that Obama is in power, he might send some ships. And everyone says the UN will do something because so many are dying and Tamils all around the world are making big protests. If tigers tell us they know what they are doing and they will defeat the army. They've defeated them so many times before. We are just hoping. Have you been telling the UN people? Yeah, of course. So what are they going to do? The government are only letting us in for 24 hours, and I'm going to try and gather as much information as possible whilst I'm here. The more information we have, the easier, the easier it will be to put pressure on me. Can I come with you? Just while you're here? Yeah, sure. Maybe I can come out with you in 24 hours? Maybe. Leaflets fall from the sky. On Rebecca's walkie-talkie, we hear an announcement. The army has created a no fire zone for civilians to gather and be safe from artillery attacks running west along the A35 road from the bridge to the junction. Do you think we should go there? It's very close to where the front line is. What are civilians doing where you are? Uh, heading there now en masse. What do you think? Everything's better than this. We've been asking for a safe zone for a while. Maybe they've finally decided to comply. Well, at least we'll be able to distribute the supplies in one place. Um, I'll keep the army informed of our position. We see a Sri Lankan government official in his office. The Sri Lankan flag is on the table. A portrait of Sri Lanka's president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, hangs over him. In the distance, we see flashes of shell fire and dull thuds, fighting going on a few kilometres away. Drones hum overhead. Rebecca stands outside a bunker and calls official on her satellite phone. We hear Rebecca's voice on speakerphone in the official's office. He takes notes while listening to the message. GPS coordinates are 6.88327.907. This is where the UN has set up an operation. We're distributing food and other supplies. Also with 12 local UN staff and their families. Please refrain from targeting the area. Rebecca 
Rebecca makes another call to Joseph, her boss, who is in Colombo. Just escape from my location. Okay, well, what's happening above the zone? Uh, the drones are passing overhead, but no artillery for an hour now. We've hoisted a flag. The UN character of this location is very clear. How many people? Hundreds of thousands. A sea of people. Uh, sheltering under tarpaulin and bits of tin leaning together. And they're starting to cook their meals. We'll, we'll try and get all staff out tomorrow. Yeah, just call us if you yeah. need us. Yeah. In the background we see a thousand tiny fires burning. Families cooking their evening meal. Neela and Rebecca lie exhausted on the ground. This is definitely a good sign. Have you ever seen this many people in one place before? I don't think so. You see, when you are here, they are scared. Yeah, even so, come on. I want to stay here just a little bit longer. Rebecca enters the bunker. The sun sets, we see the stars and the flashes and thuds of distant explosions. An hour later, we hear an approaching barrage of shells and rockets crashing. Rebecca pulls Anila into the bunker and tries to get a signal on the satellite phone. I supplied you with that coordinates an hour ago. You must tell military command to direct their fire away from this zone. I gave you the coordinates. Can you hear this? They are bombing innocent civilians and a UN convoy. People who have just eaten their meals and gone to sleep. Redirect your fire. Jo Joseph, can you hear me? They're bombing our position, Joseph. Shit. I I'll get on to them. We'll drop everything. Get inside your bunker. Something thuds on the ground in front of her. Rebecca. Are there's, you... There's Rebecca. A, there's a... I need to... Are you there? A young woman. The, the explosive force. God, it's the torso of a young woman. Some of her legs and arm. Oh Our vehicle is covered in pieces of... Oh my God, I'm going to die here, aren't I? Right now, I am waiting to die. Get inside your bunker. Can you hear them? That is the sound of 400,000 people screaming. Neela emerges and pulls Lisa back into the, uh, Rebecca back into the bunker. Many hours later, as the sun is coming up, the shelling stops. Rebecca raises the Hessian flag and peers through the, flat and peers through the bunker entrance. She starts to take photos. A woman walks over to her. <coughs> That is the body of my daughter. That is some of my husband's body. Take a photo. Take it. You see? You see the sweet face of my child? You see? What is your advice to me? Should I pick my child and carry her dead body with me to the next place we go to? Or should I dig a grave for her here? The woman starts to pull at Rebecca's hair. What is the meaning of you being here? We thought we would be safe near you. You are just pretending to help. You're not even planning to stop it, are you? Look at the sweet face of my child. Only two years old. We see a Sri Lankan official announcing on TV. The last bastion of the Tamil Tigers, the town of Mulativu, has fallen. The battle is 95% over. Where do we go now? Rebecca approaches an LTT cadre stationed in a makeshift checkpoint. Papers from his desk are being carried away in the wind. Throughout the scene, he is trying to keep as much of the paper on the desk as possible and also trying to ensure the tiger flag does not fly away. Rebecca shows her ID and passport. We see her pleading with the cadre to let the UN staff and their families out. After a while, we see the cadre motion for someone to conduct a search of the convoy. Rebecca sends a text to Neela. Searching trucks, get out, run and hide. Then another one, sorry. Rebecca walks past the checkpoint and sleepwalks into UN headquarters in Colombo. Joseph walks towards her. I want a meeting with them. We will meet them. We will. I had to leave them all there. You tried. We all tried, but it's out of our hands. Get me into a room with them. Did the tigers fire from the safe zone? Yeah, 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 there was some of that. You know what they'll say. The army corralled everyone in there and told them that that's where civilians would be safe. They bombed them for hours, Joseph. They were all out in the open. And they publicly say that they're mounting the world's largest ever hostage rescue mission. I mean, the rickshaw driver who took me here was giddy with admiration for them. Put me on TV. I'll tell them my yeah, We're going to deal with this. They are controlling this story. There hasn't been one TV clip of what's going on here. I've got proof. Pulls a memory stick out of her bra. I'm a UN employee. 
They can't refute my story with the tiger propaganda claim. You know what happened to the last two people who challenged the government? Visas revoked. Persona non grata. They will kick you out as well. We're, we're not going to do any good if we're not in the game. Yeah. I've still got the smell in my nostrils. Such a rancid smell. I mean, I'm, I'm not a soldier, you know? Maybe soldiers can cope better. Maybe they can deal with this kind of thing. How am I going to sit here every day looking at that massive billboard on the map with the red area shrinking? And listening to those jets leaving for the north? Staying sane comes down to maintaining the balance of perspective between what is and what is possible. So tell me what is possible. Oh, I'm a little out of my league here. Well, more than a little. We saw this coming. All of us. Yeah. But HQ in New York is giving us nothing. Our mission here is to provide humanitarian assistance. Well, there are a few thousand corpses who don't really give a shit about humanitarian assistance right now. The UN counts the dead, right? That's a big job. But it is possible. At night, Rebecca is working at the UN office in Colombo. She's struggling to stay away. Throughout the scene, Rebecca wanders in and out of her world and the world of the person she is talking to. A doctor appears standing behind an operating table, tending to a patient with a serious war wound. He scrubs the stain with blood from non-stop surgery. He's pulling shrapnel out of a patient's leg and throwing it into a bucket that is already half full with bloody pieces of shrapnel. Number of patients there now? About 400. And how many dead this week? Over 500 the last time I checked. Someone will send you the names. Are you getting reports from the other facilities? Same story. How are you managing? There are just five doctors left. Civil servants of the Sri Lankan government. They ordered us to leave, but we stayed without pay. And supplies? Ha! This is the high-tech ICU. No cardiac monitor, no laboratory facilities. All they send us is paracetamol, allergy tablets, vitamins, not a single bottle of intravenous fluid, antibiotic or anaesthetic. We've had to beg for supplies from the Tigers. The table revolves and we see another patient in pain. Rebecca watches while the doctor picks up some surgical instruments and starts to make incisions in the abdominal area. Yeah, another bowel surgery. He's been ripped open. Rebecca's phone rings. We see John wearing a Red Cross t-shirt making the call. UNCAG? Ah, oh, yeah, in the tradition of all things UN, you need a ridiculous acronym. What is it? C-O-G? COG! You didn't think that one through, did you? Yeah, Crisis Operation Group. What have you got for me? The mayhem, in a word. Our head of ops broke the Red Cross code of silence last week, did you hear? Yeah, about bloody time too. When are you lot going to do the same? We need numbers. This week we've counted 367 dead, 657 injured. We're trying to get the injured out on the ships, but it takes an age to get safe passage, and we're getting fired at all the time. Rebecca writes this down and walks over to the doctor. Have you eaten today? Ah. Or slept? <laughs> What's your blood type? A positive. Ah, the universal blood. Uh, you know how this works? Find a vein. Doctor removes a blood-soaked dressing from a patient and starts surgery. Rebecca sits on the floor next to the table and injects her vein. Blood starts to fill the plastic pouch. I've stopped giving them our coordinates. The last time I did that, we were shelled within the day. Bombing hospitals. Now I tell my staff, no cross on the roof, no GPS. Since then, we haven't been hit. The table revolves again. A heavily pregnant woman is now on the table. I need to have this baby now. When are you due? Three weeks. This is not an emergency, madam. In a few days, we will have to run. What will happen if I'm in labor? Your first child? Yes. Do you have a family member to help you? My husband has gone missing. Rebecca holds the hand of the patient on the operating, ta operating table. The doctor grows an extra pair of arms like a Hindu god. One arm makes an incision in the woman's abdomen. Another arm delivers the baby. Another arm cuts the cord and starts stitching the incision. Another arm wraps the baby in a towel and hands it to the mother. The table revolves again, this time a man in agony clutching at his abdomen. Yeah, I'll come back to you later. He needs antibiotics to stave off infection. He'll die. The table revolves again. Oh, double amputation. Doctor plugs his ears with his fingers while the two extra arms perform the amputation. Numbers. 690 dead, 1,200 injured. Jesus. Neela enters. Everywhere you go, you see bodies being buried. Neela becomes a series of grieving people. Doctor hoses down the bloody operating table. All they talk about now is death. Civilians are making a run for it, but the LTT are shooting at them. Rebecca's mobile ring. She rushes over to get it. Neela, are you there? 
You guys haven't even called for a ceasefire. We need to verify the numbers, triangulate the... Is there anyone else who can verify what you've told me? Yeah, there are some priests I can put you in touch with. What can you see? Patients lying under tables, in hallways, outside, in the driveways. People are being buried day and night. Everything on Rebecca's desk, lamp, folders, hole punch, calculator starts buzzing or ringing. Did you see where the girl went? The young, la the young lady who was here, was she hurt? Everything buzzes and rings again. There, there is nowhere left to go except the sea. Maybe there will be a rescue there. Have you seen her? 17 years old, she has long, dark hair. <laughs> Phones ringing, computer noises, Neil places a watch on Rebecca's desk. This belongs to Vani, a 50-year-old shopkeeper from Tampura. Some more watches and personal effects emerge or fall onto de Rebecca's desk. Neela places a number of gold necklaces around Rebecca's neck with each sentence. Mrs. Kavita was eight months pregnant and mother of a four-year-old son. A school teacher whose husband died with her, he was a car mechanic. Another mother who died on the way to the hospital. Is anyone doing anything? We need the figures. A tangible number that we can use. Who's talking to the tigers? hear me? Yes. We've covered, I'm, I'm really upset, sorry. <laughs> We've covered uh, four different uh, forms uh, this evening, all talking about um, uh, uh, you know, li literature you know, with political intent. We've looked at photography. We've looked at uh, literary nonfiction. We've looked at poetry. And we've looked at drama. And what strikes me is um, the number of similarities. Um, or the, the, the common problems with which um, one uh, seeks the right form and the right audience. Thank you very much for being this audience. But now it's your turn to ask questions for a little while. Go ahead. Is, I, is there a, a mic coming your way? Thanks very much. My name is Sandra. I've been a publisher a long time and a bit of a writer. And I've been thinking for a long time, are we missing something under the heading of collusion, the morality of collusion? Why isn't that part of our everyday television documentaries, everybody across the arts writing about it? We had Shoa, Landsman's wonderful film. Uh, a few months back, we had a marvelous piece by Andy O'Hagan about a flat the BBC were running when I was a child, when Uncle Mac was saying goodnight children everywhere, and actually the BBC were letting kids into this flat who were being sexually abused. Lots of people know lots of bad things. People who do bad things are quite often crazy or they're caught up in terrible war. But what about the rest of us? Is collusion and the morality of collusion a subject which isn't, would you see, would you feel, a subject which isn't mainstream and might be helpful? If it was, or am I just making this up? <laughs> Anybody? Go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, is the short answer. I think the, the um, it's very difficult to continually confront all the wrongs that are done in the world at uh, at the sort of strategic level, to the institutional level, to the very personal, in the playground or in the in the street, at all those levels, it's very difficult to survive if you consistently confronting every single wrong that can possibly be identified. And human beings, just as you were you were saying, uh, in, laughter is such a necessity that. Um, to be totally consumed by that sense of, of um, anger and, and uh, the, the oppression of, of seeing all, all these wrongs is fundamentally 
antipathetical to our existence, I suppose. But yeah. And it and it is. Yeah. I, I think one of the one of the, the biggest problems we have today more than maybe I don't know uh, ten years ago, twenty years ago, is that, that that collusion is is at our the very heart of the media and the media is it no longer takes the kind of risks in the mainstream anyway that um, it used to do. Um, I mean, where's satire on on TV or uh, today? It's it's parked in a in a distant place in the schedules and rarely gets an airing. There's, there's very little risk taking because everyone's so frightened of um, the kind of political backlash. So it, it's. Uh, however. However, however, yeah. however uh, the, uh, we're talking about the, the mainstream uh, media um, uh, politically controlled um, or politically led uh, with all of those, uh, the dominant narratives that go along with that. But we live in a, an age when actually the, the dominant media don't necessarily dominate everything, um, which is what, you know, you know, why you started uh, Lacuna. And it is possible, as you were saying, um, Lila, to um, uh, to make and and you as well, Christine, uh, to put out there the voices uh, that that aren't there otherwise. It is possible to get through the um, you know the, the holes in the um, you know, media systems now in a way that wasn't possible before. The disturbing thing, which I think um, uh, you've all talked about one way or another, uh, is that most people still don't seem to hear it or um, you know, get you know get the story, yes? That's, and that is, um, but it's not impossible. I'm, I'm a really horrible optimist. But I think, um, I know what we're going to be expecting from you um, is you're going to do something, on you're going to go home and write something on collusion. Great, yeah, I'll tell you everything I've done wrong after the event. Any other questions? Yes, that's it. Thank you, uh, Jonathan Hayward. I, I just think it's, it's very interesting, you know, we, we live in a world of increasingly professionalised human rights. There are now hundreds, if not thousands, of really good, really focused human rights NGOs, both in the global north and in the global south. And I think in a previous generation, we might have thought it's great to have art which captures human rights issues. There's something of inherent value in that. But in a world where there are these activists out there fighting very focused, almost forensic battles, is it important to you to be very aware of what they're doing and to, and to harness your, your work to those, those goals, to begin to working with them from the beginning and looking for very specific impacts that art might be able to work with them to achieve? Or do you still think, hang on, that could possibly compromise the aesthetic integrity or the express, ex my own individual expressive purpose? Let's put that to one side. If it's useful to them, so be it. If it's not, there's a kind of greater good somehow at work. Does that make sense? Is the, do you have answers to the question? Um, well, I guess I guess I just see what we do perhaps is just playing a very different role in, and, and as complementing what they do. Um, I mean, everything that I'm sure everything that, w that we've done has been rooted in, in very detailed research and and speaking to those people and, and making sure that what is presented is has an authenticity about it, but. But then, I mean, those, those people I know work in work in circles of their own, you know, and and there's very little bleed, <laughs> you know, from from that world to the general public, and um, and I guess you know, your what Lacuna is looking at is that is that gap between the the, the experts and the and the and the um, well, the day to day sort of news that's that sort of vomited out at us every day and how do how can we how can we authentically communicate something so complex difficult um full of all sorts of uh facets um to to people that are the lay audience you know and and make them understand this is something you should care about. This is something you should listen to, and the reason you should listen to it is because listen to listen to that person and what they've been through and what they've just said, um, rather than you know listen to it because of some some big global geopolit geopolitical kind of um, importance. It's about this person, where they are, what they've been through, 
that's why we should care. <laughs> um, and, and I guess that's, that's part of the power of, of, of art and, and of, of these kind of expressive mediums to, to connect, to connect that lay audience with those things in a way that's meaningful. Yeah. You want to? Yeah, I was, I'm interested in, in seeing more NGOs work more closely with artists, but it would be interesting to see, supposing a, an NGO actually commissioned um, a poet to write poems specifically about their campaign, would someone look at that and say, oh, that's just propaganda, that's just someone, you know, fulfilling a brief, um, but if you didn't know that the poem had been commissioned, would you read it differently? Um, I think that if there is that genuine um, approach, that thorough approach to research, that real commitment to, um, to carrying someone's voice, then I think it can be something genuine. And um, I think good, good art will do it well. I think bad art will do it badly. I think political poetry has had a, quite a bad reputation of sort of ranty soapbox type um, sort of work. And I think we can reclaim that by adding in the thoroughness and, and the craft to it. But I'd definitely like to see more NGOs commissioning artwork. I think that could be positive. Yeah, I, I, Lacuna is actually ca carrying an article on, on, this, on this theme. Uh, in, in India, uh, there's a, um, a group called Ekta Parishad who have a whole wing uh, of them, the landless um, movement, uh, for uh, uh, rights of the poor, and uh, they embrace art, photography, street theatre as part of their um, fundamental practices in uh, communicating to a broader audience as possible. And the people who get engaged in that, who can come from all over the world, the filmmakers, uh, the British f um, photographers, uh, Indian uh, directors um, and performers, it's a whole mix of people with the view to communicating what the central message is, um, both to their constituents and to everybody else in politics and the media and what have you. So th they don't see it as something that's a, a compromise at all. Um, and, and George Orwell said that there's nothing wrong with propaganda. Mm. Uh, it be it's become a dirty word, mm. um, but there's nothing wrong with it, before, provided your political convictions uh, justify it. Uh, justify communicating those messages in an aesthetic way. That's all it is. But just very quickly to go back to the, qu the question of uh, uh, working with um, uh, NGOs and uh, very focused activists, the excerpt of the, of, of the play is about um, you know, the problems that uh, people working in the field, uh, the very, very real problems they uh, encounter and also cause. And um, I don't think there's an NGO out there um, that's doing that. That's doing what? That's, that's actually showing uh, what the problems are of being a human rights activist. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, no, no NGO would commission that. <laughs> that <laughs> way. Um, yeah, you mean, I've been commissioned by um, NGOs and Amnesty and things like that before, um, and it's very, it's quite instrumentalist, you know, and it's very, it's they're the commissioner. They want, they tell you what the message is going to be. You have very little say and very little in, kind of interpret, interpretation. Um, so, so yes, that that does restrict, you know, um, and in, and in the and in this play, you know, I I try to show as many viewpoints as possible, and and not try and privilege one over the other because it's, you know, that's that's not the role of, of something like this. I think it's about, okay, let's ask these questions. Let these questions be there for you to to, to sort of um, be, be posed to you, and then you decide um, rather than you know coming from. This is how. This is what we believe, and this is what you're going to go away with, you know. Um, so you're saying that the point of art is to be very, very inconvenient. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. There. yeah. I think One we have time for another question. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'd just like to drill down slightly in something you said, and hope perhaps I misunderstood, uh, which is about law. And I can certainly understand how after doing it for 20 years, it might not be hitting the right buttons for you. And you might <laughs> want to be less academic and write something of this wonderful sort you have. 
but I hope you're not saying it doesn't have a place because heaven help us if we abandon the reductionist, very evidence-based and um, solid basis of the rule of law. Yeah, no, um, uh, let me put, you, put, put it straight, uh, my message straight, that the, the, the sort of the, the necessity of law and its attention to detail and its, uh, its, its rigor uh, is, is absolutely essential. But there, there comes a time when the form of law, the vocabulary of, of lawyers, can, uh, has seemed to me, to suppress um, the emotion the, the sense of connection with wrong. And sometimes law is a deflection, or the process of law is a deflection. You, you just see how many public inquiries we have that are focused on legal procedure and uh, take decades to get through. That's a, that's a matter of law. That's a problem of law. And it's those kind of forms and vocabulary that I, I rail against. Um, not the fundamental sense of what law is for and what it can, uh, what the values it can espouse. But it's going to get harder. I mean, I progressed a legal mm, case, yeah. you know, high court, European court. But, you know, as legal aid is becoming mm. less and less available mm. to people, those <coughs> kind of human rights cases are going to be much harder to progress. And that's the only way you're going to really have a chance of creating sort of fundamental wrongs, really. So it's not looking great at the moment. So it's not over, but we are over. Uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for being such a wonderful audience. I want to thank uh, Christine, Lila, Andrew, and Leslie. And there are some books.